What's going on, AP students? I want to share with you something that I presented at an EdCamp in-service at Hewitt Trussell High School back in June. We'll start off by looking at inference strategies. What does that mean to infer in AP US history? We'll look at some primary sources and some stimulus-based questions that you'll see on your regular test in AP US history. And then finally, we're going to look at how to analyze a political cartoon as well. Let's start with what does it mean to infer? You have a classic definition down there below. But we're going to start with this, an educated guess that we make based on the information that is right in front of us combined with our past experiences. So we'll start off by looking at that. Secondly, we'll look at um, primary sources. I want you to be, start thinking by analyzing the sourcing information. I'll show you an example of that. Many, many examples coming up. Um, number three, I want to show you how to annotate, and I'll highlight that. I'll put some things in bold and red, and I'll show you how to do that here in a moment. Um, pictures and how that can also be used to infer, to figure out an answer to a question. And then finally, what should you do if you encounter a tricky word that you're not sure about? So maybe take a look at that, pause the video, but we're gonna keep going forward. So a lot of times in APU as history, what I encounter as a teacher is students that like to think very linearly, as in they, they like to think of the start and the finish, the very, almost like history is a narrative. And that's very easy to do and very common in your average history classes or on level general history class as well. Um, a lot of times people think of it that way and that's, and that's important and that's a good skill to think about and, and to have, but that's not exactly what uh, you're going to encounter in APU as history. So students often look for the answer to a question to be explicitly in the reading word for word. And you might see something like this. Though. Consider the question that you have before you, a quote from Franklin Roosevelt's second inaugural address in 1937. Let's pretend that we just got finished studying the Great Depression. And so take a look at it, and I want to show you exactly what students are used to. They see that part of the question and that quote, they see that part of the quote, and they might read the question at the bottom. Franklin Roosevelt addresses situation described in the speech by, and they'll say, B, supporting programs to aid the poor and unemployed. Well, you can look back at the quote, and you can see that it's word for word in there. And so students are kind of used to that, but that's not always what you're going to see in an AP U.S. history class. Let's consider this quote by Bartolome de las Casas, a priest and social reformer, his writing his work is called In Defense of the Indian, written in 1550. So think about it first. If we just got done studying this, this time frame, this time period in U.S. history, period one, um, think about what's going on in 1550. So first, look at the date. Always when you get these kinds of questions in AP U.S. history, start with the date and think about what is the context of the quote, what's happening at the time. I think this is a little over 50 years after Christopher Columbus supposedly found America. What can you tell about the author, male, female? Um, are they wealthy, poor? Um, where are they from? Just by the pronunciation of the name, can you tell? Sounds Hispanic to me. Can you tell anything about their job in this quote? Yes. What do we know about this person's opinion? And always be searching for some sort of bias. What is the key word in the title of this document? What does the essay suggest the quote's going to be about? And then I want you to think about when you encounter a stimulus-based question to always annotate it. So I hope you see the importance of starting with a sourcing. You might can predict a lot about what the quote's going to be about. Now, I'm not going to read everything that's in this particular quote, but I want to emphasize the things that are in red. So personally, I like to annotate quotes. I like to mark them up. I have to underline things that I think are important. So you look over here and look at the key excerpts. You're talking about the treatment of the Native Americans by the Spaniards. So go out into the woods and find food and to die. They're delicate people unaccustomed to such work, kicked and beat them. And so you can kind of get the gist of what's happening. So what, who, what created the situation? Who appears to be the bad guy, the Spanish or the Indians? What is caspa? Here's a word that seems a little bit unfamiliar. What can you infer this word means if you are not familiar with it? I like to tell my students to cover that word up and then and, and treat it as if there's just a gigantic blank right there. Then reread the sentence and see if you can come up with another word to substitute for it. And I ask my students, okay, after doing that, can you tell me what that word means? And they'll likely say, well, uh, probably something dealing with food. Same thing for league. You don't see that word very often used in modern day language. So again, cover that word up and then reread the sentence. Now, can you infer what that word might mean? I'll ask my students that same question and they'll say, well, it probably means something dealing with distance. Distance. So 
going on with it. So you see hungry, hungry, falling first into the stream. Um, you can tell a lot if you were you tell a lot about a quote and what the what it's going to be about if you annotate it as well. So what can you infer about the Spanish after reading that part? And again, what can you infer about the Spanish after reading this section of the quote from De Las Casas as well? Let's look at some examples of some stimulus-based questions you might see that might go along with a quote like that. So which of the following best explains the underlying cause of the Spanish actions described by Las Casas? Oftentimes students will look at a quote or they'll know a lot of information. They'll try to bring in a lot of outside information. This particular question says described by Las Casas. So you have to stay within that box of that stimulus-based question. So be thinking about that as you answer this one. So which of the following best explains? You see how I like to annotate? There I go again. It best explains the underlying cause. So I'm searching for a cause in this particular question. I will look back at the quote and the answer is going to be A, racism the underlying cause. Another example, the primary audience that Las Casas hoped to influence by his writing was, and a lot of people will look at the idea of the fact that he was a priest and they might jump to the conclusion, well, it's got to be the Catholic Church. Well, you've got to know the history of what's happening around 1550, because in this case, it's going to be A, the monarchs of Spain, these people that are, that are paying and then they're sponsoring these explorers and conquistadors and so forth to go across the sea and to go start settling this new world. So that's what you're going to see for that one. The third example, which of the following factors that affected Native Americans is directly implied but not stated? So again, you have to have a very strong um, skill using um, uh, inference when reading a document. So for this particular one, it's going to be C, European diseases were killing millions of Native Americans. That is not, that's not word for word stated in the quote, but that's what you'll see with that one. So I hope that one makes sense. Before we finish out for this video, I want to look at a cartoon. This cartoon was on the previous AP U.S. History exam, and it is a tricky one. Always begin by looking around. Don't try to absorb every little detail that's in the cartoon all at once, or you'll get a little overwhelmed. But as always, what do you see in this cartoon? I want you to begin by thinking about a few things. So with students on the AP U.S. History exam, um, on, uh, in the last one at least, they jumped to conclusions on a few things. At first, they didn't understand that the cartoon was about reconstruction. If you look down at the bottom, you have your dates. That's why it's so important to always start with the sourcing. You can tell so much, 1869 to 77, so you know that it's right after the Civil War. You're talking about the time period right after the Civil War. And then oftentimes in my class, we talk about the significance of the year 1877. So hopefully a lot of my students, when they encountered this cartoon, saw 1877 and said, OK, well, we're talking about, again, the end of Reconstruction. But a lot of people jump to conclusion if they don't have a strong skill in inferring what, what things mean. For example, to the right, they looked at the steamboat and jumped to the conclusion, well, this is the market revolution from the early 1800s. We have all these inventors, new inventions coming into play. Then a lot of people looked at the soldiers, they looked at the hat, at the guy, the very top part of the picture, and they thought, well, that must represent the American Revolution. Soldiers and kind of outdated old school hats. They looked at the woman in the picture, and they thought, okay, here's a woman, seems to be oppressed right here. She's chained, she's working, walking barefoot on um, gravel and, and hard rocks and so forth. But they skipped the fact that it says right there on her dress, the solid South. So they have to take it, uh, it took it and, and interpreted it very differently. But sometimes it's right there in front of you. If you pay close attention to that detail, the solid South representative of that person. So you got the strong government versus the weak government. And so a lot of people struggle to, to grasp, well, what are, who are the men in this p particular picture? I mean, that's why it's so important to pay attention to the pictures that you have in a PowerPoint and include those, because here you have uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And so you've got, again, that would help to know a little bit about the sourcing down at the bottom, the dating, the dates, 1869 to 77, just knowing who's in charge, who's in power around this time period. Some people take this as a section of the picture very literally. Um, a let them alone policy. They mistakenly thought this part of the cartoon was about laissez-faire economics since it applies leaving the South alone. But here in a moment, you'll see that you, there's, there, you can interpret it very differently. So again, start with the sourcing, always with the date, generally knowing well, what's happening around this time period in U.S. history. And then think, what does this mean? Strong versus weak? Are they being snarky with this? 
exactly what are they shooting for with that. So I always go around. I, I like to think about going around the photo rather than absorbing it all at once. So who is the guy at the top? Ulysses S. Grant. Why is the boat sinking in the background in 1869 to 77? Look at this one as well. The steamboat is destroyed. It's, it's broken. You see burned farms at the back and then carpet, bag, and bayonet rule. Hopefully my students remembered that, those key terms from Reconstruction. What is a carpet bag? Who is a carpet bagger? Who are these guys right here? These are in blue uniforms, so you get um, Union soldiers right up the Civil War. We talked about the Solid South. Um, you can see how she's chained and how the Union soldiers are propping up this carpet bag. So, um, again, barefoot, walking on sharp rocks and gravel. So again, the strong government thing is this very is this very, is the author being snarky about this person about this particular cartoon? In the back of the next one, the weak government seems like Southerners are coming back into power. You see how the boats are back up and running. You've got businesses, agriculture booming again. We're back in business. Um, the let them alone policy. Now, hopefully, this clears up when the North is away and Southerners are back in charge. What's happening? The let them alone policy. That says bloody shirt. It's kind of hard to see. And then it also says bayonet rule. Hopefully my students remembered that. What does that exactly mean? And then it's hard. It's easy to, to miss some things in a cartoon. For this particular one, I missed the fact that the carpet bag um, was actually being buried. When I first saw this, I didn't, I didn't catch that. So the carpet bag to the left is actually being buried in the right-hand side of the picture. It's like Southerners are coming back into power. But probably the most significant part of the picture which in the right-hand part is the fact that you see an African-American man being forced to be made to go back out and work out in the fields. So you can tell a lot about a cartoon if you take it section by section rather than just absorbing it all at once. Okay, I hope that was helpful. If you still have some more questions, please let me know. Be glad to help out. All right, thanks for watching.